Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Today is January 4th, 2024. Top story this morning. We finally got a little bit of green. It's our first green of 2024. Some stocks are up, but not all of them. Certainly not Apple, who just caught their second analyst downgrade of the year. And we're only, what, four days into the year. Not going so well for Apple thus far. We've got Piper Sandler downgraded Apple today, citing iPhone concerns specifically iPhone concerns in China, weak demand in China that they're worried about affecting Apple. And of course, that's a problem. We've seen Apple's revenues have fallen for, what, four consecutive quarters, and yet Apple stock did nothing but rise the whole time their revenue was falling. It's been tough to be a bear in this environment. Like, hey, guys, these companies are taking in less money. The stock is going up. That doesn't make sense. Oh, bro, you're just an angry bear. <laughs> That's pretty much been the last year, and all of a sudden, the calendar flips to 2024, and the analysts are like, oh, that's right. The whole point of a business is to make money. Maybe we should check if that's happening. Whoops, it's not. So Apple has been downgraded for the second time now, and let's talk about the weakness and demand in China for a second, because there was an article in Bloomberg yesterday, uh, pretty potent stuff, worrying about deflation in China, something I've been talking about since... 2021 on this channel, there is a immense deflationary force on the ground in China right now being caused by the collapse of their housing sector. And that is very rapidly spilling over into their consumer sector because of the wealth effect, a psychological phenomenon that people spend more money when they feel like their house is more valuable. People spend less money when they feel like their house is less valuable. And you've got a China, the average Chinese consumer who has virtually all of his or her wealth tied up in real estate. That is a recipe for consumer disaster because the Chinese real estate bubble is the arguably the biggest bubble in human history. And so that's starting to affect everything in China. We got an article yesterday that said the average starting salary in, I think it was like 30 different major Chinese cities that they pulled, the average starting salary fell by 1.3% in the most recent quarter. That's a year-over-year change, and that is three consecutive quarters of negative nominal wage growth, not adjusted for inflation. We're not talking about wage gains not keeping up with the rate of inflation like we have here in the States. We're talking about wages going down. Three quarters in a row in China. How are people going to buy expensive iPhones If, number one, the animosity between China and the United States, that's not going anywhere fast. And number two, people aren't making any money. Number three, people feel poor because their house has gone down in value. That's assuming they didn't buy a house and take out a mortgage for an apartment that hasn't even been built yet and probably never will get built. Lo and behold, Chinese consumers are not shopping as much. That's bad news for Apple. That is weighing on the market this morning. Now, we also got a lot of labor data in the last two days. It paints something of a mixed picture. Some of it was good. And when I say good, meaning economic growth, not, you know, good is bad because Fed, that's that's silly nonsense. When we say good, we'll we'll talk about a strong labor market, right? We did get some good numbers from ADP today, 164,000 jobs added according to ADP's private payrolls report. Um, I would add the ADP number very often differs substantially from the more important non-farm payrolls number that we're going to get tomorrow. That's a big one. That will move markets. ADP does tend to give you a bit of a preview, though. Um, It was up 164,000. That's after being up 100,000 last month. So it shows job growth trending in an upward direction. We also got JOLTS data yesterday. JOLTS stands for Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. It counts people changing jobs, quitting jobs. And, well, JOLTS uh, job openings, the number of open positions in the states, fell by 62,000 to 8.790 million. Now, fewer job openings could mean we filled the position and therefore it is no longer posted, or it could mean we were going to hire somebody, but then we realized the economy sucks and now we're not going to. Doesn't say how the position, how the opening went away. We'll get a better idea of that when the non-farm payrolls comes out. Uh, But JOLT's job openings has been falling substantially for the better part of a year and a half now. This wasn't that big of a fall, down 62,000, but it is a continuation of the trend. 
fewer job openings. So that would suggest a little bit of weakness in the labor market. Job quits fell again to 3.471 million people quitting their job in the last month. Now, that is roughly in line with pre-pandemic levels. So the great resignation, people quitting their jobs, four and a half, five million people a month quitting their jobs, that is gone, not happening anymore. That reflects weakness in the job market because people are less confident that they'll be able to find a new job and therefore they're not quitting their job as fast. So that suggests a little bit of a little bit of weakness in the job market to see quits coming down. Uh, but then we got initial and continuing claims this morning, and those were both down slightly for this week. So that shows a little bit of strength in the labor market. So we've got some conflicting data here. It's a mixed picture, but I can tell you this. there is If you're looking for that data point that says unemployment is about to skyrocket, you didn't get it yet. And so all you, all you Fed guys that are out there and, and everybody pricing in the six rate cuts this year, why? Where is the mandate to cut interest rates? The labor market is still strong. Maybe it's not as strong as the data has been suggesting all along for the last year or so. But guys, the unemployment rate is still down. The, the number of job openings is still significant. The number of jobs being created, it's still at least enough to keep up with population growth right around it. The job market isn't really that weak. So how are you going to cut rates, especially with asset valuations at in historic balloon levels? There just is no mandate to cut rates. And while that was reflected a little bit in the Fed minutes that got released yesterday, they were a little bit more hawkish than people were hoping for. So that contributed to the sell-off in stocks yesterday. Uh, one thing that does, a little anecdote here, we got Xerox announced that they are laying off about 3,000 employees part of a restructuring. They're laying off about 15% of their workforce. So there's another anecdote about those layoffs. But when layoffs happen, remember, they don't hit the unemployment rolls for several months because when someone gets laid off, they usually get a severance, a couple of months of severance. And so they don't count as unemployed until that severance wears off. So those Xerox layoffs probably won't hit unemployment numbers anytime soon. Walgreens announced this morning that they're cutting their dividend in half because, well, it's been a terrible year for Walgreens. Their stock has been just bludgeoned. It was up earlier on the news that they had cut their dividend in half. I guess that the balance sheet was going to look a little healthier. And at a 7.5% yield, this was a pretty well-telegraphed move. It was pretty obvious Walgreens' dividend was going to end up cut. That happened. And, of course, the Red Sea is still a thing. Uh, long story short, guys, Operation Prosperity Garden thus far is a failure. It has failed to provide freedom of navigation for container ships. They're not even trying because the attacks are continuing. And so the clock is ticking. It is a, only a matter of time before things escalate in the Red Sea. There was a strongly worded letter was released yesterday, signed by 10 countries that basically says, Houthis, cut that out or else. It's a formality. In my opinion, it is only a matter of time before the U.S. goes offensive, because right now the U.S. is losing face, looking very weak because Prosperity Garden is not working and it's not the fault of the Navy. The U.S. Navy has been near perfect shooting down everything that the Houthis have lobbed at them. That is the stuff that hasn't harmlessly splashed into the ocean. But the U.S. Navy can't be everywhere at once in a defensive posture. And so if they don't go on offense, they're not going to be able to protect shipping. So they either give up or they go on offense. My bet is they go on offense. I don't want to see a war in the Middle East. I don't want to see an escalation in the Red Sea. But it really looks like that's what's coming. And then, of course, looking several moves ahead, the question is, what do the Iranians do once that happens? We'll find out in a couple of days. With that, why don't we shrink my big melon of a head and let's see what's going on in markets this morning. Don't forget that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. We do this every morning. So have your coffee with the melon heads. Fear Greed Index. We are out of extreme greed territory. So we're going to put this one away for a while. I just that was noteworthy. We mentioned it yesterday that we probably won't be in extreme greed much longer because we've had a couple of big down days. Um, we've seen rates go higher. So the, the market is getting a little more fearful, but still deep, deep into greed territory. We've got the S&P is negative now. Well, you know, we had our first bull thumbnail of the year because two of the three indexes were green this morning. So much for that. Oh, look, it just went green while I was running my big mouth. Maybe I should shut up now. Uh, all of a sudden, the number of likes on this video goes up, right? As I say, maybe I should shut up. The S&P is essentially flat right now, unchanged on the day. We have got the Dow is up 88 points or about a quarter of 1% higher ahead of the opening bell.
but the NASDAQ is still in the doldrums, down another 65 points. The NASDAQ has really been bludgeoned since the start of the year, down over 400 points in the first two trading days. Looks like we're set to add to that this morning. Uh, due for a bounce at some point, I mean, nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down forever, but big tech, notably the MAG7, have had a lousy start to the year, and that second Apple downgrade, that's not going to help. We've got the DXY is uh, barely negative today. We're at 102.44. That's down five basis points. The Dixie was further negative in the morning. It strengthened a little bit over these last few hours. My guess is it's strengthening on this labor data because if the labor data, if you were looking for data to support rate cuts, you didn't get that today. So they're, the basis for a weaker dollar just isn't really there at the moment because the Fed has nothing to 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 justify cutting, not when inflation is still above their target and not when assets are at balloon valuations. So market may need to rethink those six rate cuts that they are pricing in for 2024. Right now in the bond market, we've got the long end of the yield curve is higher by a good amount this morning. Meanwhile, the short end is a little bit lower, essentially unchanged. 30-year treasury yielding 4.113. That's up five and a half basis points this morning. The 10-year is threatening that 4% level, 3.993% yield on the 10-year treasury. That is up almost nine basis points this morning. Remember, guys, when you see yields going higher, that is bond prices going lower. So got a little bit of a sell-off on the long end of the yield curve this morning. The two-year treasury at 4.351. That is up three basis points. And the one month is at 538 Looking over at commodities, we've got gold is uh, doing okay this morning. February gold futures at 2047 That's up about 4 bucks. Uh, you'd think gold would be heading a little bit lower on that stronger dollar and the higher interest rates over the last few days. Gold has actually held up pretty well over the last three or four trading days, considering that rates are staging a little bit of a comeback here. Uh, March silver futures at 2302 That's down 13 cents or about a half a percent. Silver not doing quite as well as gold here. We've got platinum and palladium are both down a percent and change this morning. And February, West Texas Intermediate crude oil futures at 73.16. That's up about another 40 cents or about 0.6% higher this morning. Here is the main story, though. Apple hit with second downgrade this week as iPhone worries grow. It's the second time in essentially three days. We've, we're only three days into the trading year. Is this the fourth day? Okay, this is the – no, it's the third day. We, Monday was a, Monday was closed. Two downgrades in three days for Apple. Been a rough start to the year for Apple. Stock has erased about $130 billion in value so far this year. And Apple actually holds the fewest bullish ratings among the big tech stocks. Apple was already the least loved big tech stock on Wall Street. Growing concerns over iPhone sales have now triggered a second downgrade this week, cementing analysts' cautious approach. Piper Sandler and Co.'s Harsh Kumar cut his Apple rating on Thursday, citing a weak macro environment in China that will dampen demand for iPhones. We are concerned about handset inventories, Kumar said in a note, lowering his recommendation for Apple to neutral from overweight after holding a bullish view since, since March of 2020. Growth rates have peaked for unit sales, he said. And I just want to mention this important thing here, guys. Apple was the only big tech firm to see revenues contract for the past four quarters. Wall Street is currently anticipating revenue growth of just 3.6% in fiscal year 2024, profit expansion of 7.9%, according to average analyst estimates compiled by Bloomberg. Four consecutive quarters of revenue contraction for Apple. How, how is not everybody screaming this from the, from the rooftops that the biggest company in the world has seen revenue fall for four consecutive quarters and yet everybody is in the financial press talking about how great everything is in the soft landing and the tree in the nest. Yay, unicorns and rainbows. I mean, look at Apple stock, guys. This is going back to about a year ago. Now, it's been trading sideways since late summer, but look at this March straight up. Revenue has been declining this whole time, and yet here the stock is near all-time highs, finally starting to come to its senses at the beginning of the year on a couple of these analyst downgrades. But where have all these analysts been But while revenues have been falling? The whole point of this is to make money. Sometimes we forget about that. Oh, but the Fed do this and liquidity do this. Yeah, does the company make money? No. Stock go down. It's more complex than that. I get it. But, you know, let's start with that simple litmus test and then work from there. And why is everybody worried about Apple? I can tell you this is a big concern. China workers suffer biggest drop in hiring salaries on record. Deflation in China 
That is bad news for any company that gets a lot of its earnings from China, Apple chief among them. Average wages for new hires fell by the most since at least 2016, and a dismal labor market adds to risks of persisting deflation. Remember, guys, it was something like uh, six, eight months ago, China's youth unemployment rate hit 21%, and then China just said, you know what, we're not going to keep track of this anymore. Problem solved. We're just not going to tell people what the number is. Well, based on this information, it is a good bet that that youth unemployment has continued to rise, even though they solved the problem by just not reporting youth unemployment anymore. Wages offered to Chinese workers in major cities declined by the most on record, underscoring persistent deflationary pressures and sluggish consumer confidence in the world's second largest economy. Average salaries offered by companies to new hires, key emphasis, key emphasis there, new hires, so that is probably a lot of young people, in 38 key Chinese cities, it fell by 1.3% to 10,420 yuan, or just $1,458 in the fourth quarter of 2023 from a year ago. That's the average salary, guys, per capita GDP in China. Still way, way down there. That was the worst drop since at least 2016, according to data from online recruiting platform Jopin, compiled by Bloomberg. It's also the third straight quarter of decline the longest run since data on yearly changes were first available in 2016. So we have got four consecutive quarters of declining revenue for Apple, three consecutive quarters of declining starting salaries for young people in China. You see now why the analysts are worried about iPhone sales in China right now? And check out this chart here. Let me zoom in a little bit, make a little bit bigger for you here. Chinese urban workers see record drop in hiring wages. Now, this bar here, these are showing the year-over-year -year change in starting salaries. And this is these are quarterly snapshots. Positive number indicates growth. You can see we did dip negative for one quarter in 2018, barely. We dipped negative for one quarter in 2020. But look here, three consecutive quarters of negative growth in starting salaries in these major Chinese cities, and it's getting worse. This is the biggest dip on record, 1.3% year-over-year -year decline in starting salaries in the fourth quarter of 2020, excuse me, 2023. So the situation in China is not looking good, something we've been talking about on this channel for a long time. I know a lot of you guys are like, when China collapse, the point is China is collapsing. It has been happening for years. It's happening very slow, and they're changing the law to say you're not allowed to say bad things about the economy in China. True story. That actually happened. And they're changing the law to say we're not going to tell people how our young people are all out of work, even though we don't have nearly enough young people. We still can't find work for the ones we do have. Things in China are getting bad, and they're getting bad fast. But enough about China. Let's talk about the U.S. We got this one today. ADP employment change. Private businesses in the U.S. hired 164,000 workers in December. That's higher than the downwardly revised 101,000 in November and beating forecasts of 115,000. ADP private payrolls data. So we have got more jobs added than expected. This is not the most important data point that's out there in the labor market. The non-farm payrolls number we're going to get tomorrow, much more important. But this is a good indicator, and it shows that numbers ticked up a little bit. We didn't get that negative number. If you're expecting a surge in unemployment, we're probably not going to get it this month. So a little bit of resilience showing in the labor market here, at least on ADP. Now let's talk about job openings, because this one's a little contrary to ADP. The number of job openings decreased by 62,000 from the previous month to 8.790 million in November. That's marking the lowest level since March of 2021 and falling below the market consensus of 8.85 million. So we got fewer job openings in the U.S. by 65,000, not a huge decline, but a decline nonetheless and a continuation of a trend that's been going for a while. Now, I just want to show you guys this five-year trend of job openings in the United States. And this is important because we saw this huge surge of job openings during the pandemic the helicopter money, there was a lot of hiring, but you also had work from home. And something I've talked about on this channel, I think we have more job openings posted than we actually have more job openings in the United States. I think this number is deceptively high because if you're posting a work from home job, which a lot of companies still are doing, you can post that in five or six different major cities. 
And well, the Jolts report will count that as five or six job openings, even though there's really one underlying position behind six openings. And that's why this number is falling, but still well above the pre-pandemic level of around six and a half to seven million openings. I actually think the opening situation is even worse than this chart is showing. So this number shows a little bit of weakness in the job market. Same thing with the job quits number, which we're looking at here now. Job quits in the United States decreased to 3.471 million in November. That's down from 3.628 million in October. So a lot fewer people quitting their jobs now. Again, that trend is falling. Here's the great resignation, guys, when almost 4.5 million people a month were quitting their job because there were so many job postings and openings. And work from home enabled people to start bidding jobs in other cities that maybe historically they were, you know, just basically not a candidate for. That number has been falling along with the number of job openings. So, again, this is showing a little bit of weakness in the labor market here. We're going back and forth between strength and weakness in this data. There's no prevalent trend at the moment. But people are quitting their jobs at a slower rate, probably because it's harder to find a new one. Now we've got initial jobless claims for the week ended December 30th. This shows an adjusted initial claim was 202,000. That's a decrease of 18,000 from the previous week's number. So people initially filing for unemployment benefits fell by 18,000. Um, that one is trending down a little bit. Again, if we were going to see a big surge in unemployment, we would see it in first in the initial jobless claims, but we're just not getting it right now. Those are actually falling. And continuing jobless claims, this is something we talked about for a while. We were showing continuing jobless claims were rising steadily, even though initial claims weren't that weren't that high. And that was showing, okay, maybe people aren't losing their jobs in mass, but once they do lose their job, they're having a harder time finding a new one. Well, that trend has leveled off since the middle of November. Maybe interest rates played a role in that. But right now, continuing jobless claims in the U.S., which measures unemployed people who have been receiving unemployment benefits for a while, that fell to 1.855 million for the week ended December 23rd. This should say December 30th versus a revised 1.886 million from the week before. So continuing claims have stopped piling up. They've leveled off. They're not coming down, really, but they've stopped piling up. So, again, a little bit of strength in the labor market with this data point. Onward to some other data we got today. Xerox cutting 15% of its workforce. So there's another anecdote about layoffs. Xerox has about 20,500 employees. So we're looking at about 3,000 layoffs here. That's 15% of Xerox workforce. And they're saying they will carry out these cuts in this current quarter. So between now and March, 3,000 people at Xerox will be losing their jobs. Also today, we got Walgreens. Check this one out. Posted earnings beat, but slashed their quarterly dividend nearly in half been a tough year for Walgreens. They reported earnings, again, adjusted earnings because somehow they lost money in the quarter, but they're still reporting adjusted earnings. Yay for generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, but the big story today, the retail pharmacy giant slashed its dividend to 25 cents. That's down from 48 cents per share to strengthen its long-term balance sheet and cash position. Uh, I just want to add some of the data here. The most important paragraph I found in this article, retail sales for the quarter fell by 6.1% from the same period a year ago. And the most important data point, comparable retail sales declined by 5%. That is awful, guys. When same store sales are down by 5 point, by 5% in a quarter, your business has a big problem. And that is why Walgreens is slashing their dividend because their sales are dropping Walgreens pointed to a weaker respiratory season as well as macroeconomic driven consumer trends and Thanksgiving holiday store closures are first for the company last year to explain the decrease. Walgreens stock at the moment is down 4.8%. Yikes, 5% now. Walgreens falling off a cliff right now, uh, not doing so well. People aren't liking that dividend cut, which again, guys, the dividend yield was previously 7.5%. When you see a dividend of 7.5% on a company like Walgreens, the writing is on the wall. That dividend will not be staying there for long. You probably could have seen this one coming. And look, I know we got some Red Sea fatigue out there, but we have to keep track of this story, guys. This is a very important macroeconomic story. U.S. and other countries warned the Houthis against further attacks in the Red Sea. Oh, no, a strongly worded letter say it ain't so. 
Afraid so, guys. More than a dozen countries warned the Houthis, a Yemen-based rebel group backed by Iran, against continuing their attacks on shipping in the Red Sea, which have disrupted global commerce and triggered a limited military response from the U.S. Emphasis on limited. Our guys aren't allowed to shoot back. The Houthis will bear the responsibility of the consequences should they continue to threaten lives, the global economy, and free flow of commerce in the region's critical waterways. That's from the governments, including the U.S., the U.K., Australia, Bahrain, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Italy, Spain. Well, I don't know why I said Spain. Spain was not in that list. Japan, Netherlands, and New Zealand said in a joint statement. I, I, I don't understand why Spain just came out of my mouth there. It's not written there. My brain just went to Spain for some reason. All right, getting out of Spain, most of these countries have declined the United States invitation to send warships to actually contribute to the defense of the shipping lanes, even though their shipping traverses that shipping lane, so they see the benefits of our guys putting their necks on the lines. So they wouldn't send any warships. Well, a few did. The, the UK sent warships. France did. So I guess the administration said, come on, guys, you won't send any boats. Will you at least sign my letter? And they said, OK, we'll sign your strongly worded letter. We, we will condemn these attacks with very strong language. There could even be profanity used. I don't know, just throwing it out there. Don't make me use profanity. Illegal, unacceptable, all kinds of words thrown in there. Uh, guys, this is a matter of time before this thing escalates because Operation Prosperity Garden has failed in its goal. We showed that image yesterday showing container traffic moving to or from Europe and North America. Zilch, none of it. There are no container ships traversing the Red Sea right now. So the whole point of Prosperity Guardian was to reestablish that shipping lane and protect those ships. And the shippers will not take that route, which means Prosperity Garden isn't working, which means they either escalate or they get out of Dodge. And well, with shipping rates soaring 173% for Red Sea diversions, my money is on escalation. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope everybody just stops shooting at each other and just does business. Why is that so hard? Apparently, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm just naive and overly uh, overly optimistic. But just, just an idea. Stop shooting at each other and go to work. What a concept. Suez traffic is down 28% in the past 10 days, and the risk of congestion rises heading into the Chinese Lunar New Year. Uh, guys with numbers like this, which I would add are still nowhere near the highs that we saw during the pandemic and the congestion at U.S. ports, but still, this is going to bring back inflation. This is going to drive up consumer costs. This is going to add to business headaches. It's only a matter of time before missiles start flying in both directions over this stuff. And that letter seems like a formality, that strongly worded letter like, hey, we better ask them nicely one more time before we start shooting. It looks like that's what's about to happen. So I hope it doesn't end that way. But it seems like the writing is on the wall there, guys. And I just want to say thank you very much to the inflation situation who says got lucky and bought puts on GDX last week. You're probably doing all right there. Here's your share, boss. Happy New Year. Well, thank you very much, inflation situation. I appreciate that very much. Congratulations on those GDX puts. GDX got bludgeoned yesterday. Absolutely crushed. Uh, higher oil prices. Higher interest rates, stronger dollar, which we've seen in the last two or three days. You know, keep in mind the last month we haven't necessarily seen that. But those three things that so far have defined 2024, none of those are good for mining stocks. So GDX has had a rough go of it since the start of the new year. Thank you very much, Inflation Situation, sir, for the, for the good vibes and for the support of the channel. And congratulations again on those puts. And thank you to Steve Wojtas, who says, my aunt runs a food bank. She tells me demand is at a new high. However, donations have dropped. I, too, have read that all over the country that that is happening. Uh, folks can't afford to buy extra groceries to donate. That, that is the great irony of food banks is donations to them dry up at the time when they are most needed. Um, something to think about, guys. Support your local food banks. Um, I know times are tough, but uh, you know that, that's, that's the catch-22 is you know when times are good, when they're not as needed, the donations are free-flowing and they got plenty of cash. And then right as people start lining up at food banks, the donations stop coming in. So shout out to your aunt, Steve Voidis. That is noble work that she is doing. Support your local food banks, folks. And thank you, Steve, for the super chat and the support of the channel. And thank you to Trader Monkey, who says another great rundown. Thanks, Jack. Well, you're very welcome, Trader Monkey. And I appreciate the super chat, the support of the channel, and the kind words, sir. 100 million melon coin to the Trader Monkey. And Steve Canyon says, NSF is the only one that I know of reporting on the Red Sea. Thank you, Mr. Melonhead. I'm trying not to oversaturate on that story, Steve, but I really think that is really, really important. 
especially because the, the one thing that the, the elephant in the room that nobody is talking about is if we escalate, then we are one escalation away from oil market mayhem. Because we, I, I mentioned this on my Zoom call a few weeks ago with my Patreon supporters. Shout out to my Patreon guys. Thank you for supporting the channel. That we were two escalations away from something really economically awful happening. Those two escalations are the U.S. decides to finally start shooting back and go on offense, which when you park ships in harm's way and they're shot at every day, the longer you do that, sooner or later, some kid is going to get killed and we can't have that. Uh, so either either do it or get out, one or the other. And it looks like they're going to do it. That would be the first escalation if the U.S. goes on the offensive and starts bombing the launch sites in Yemen or taking out the Iranian ships that are providing the targeting data to them. That's one escalation. And then the second escalation would be what if the Iranians decide to counterattack based on that, which would be closing off the Strait of Hormuz. And if, if this spreads from the Red Sea to the Strait of Hormuz, guys, get ready for 200 possibly even $300 barrel oil. Uh, it's happened before, maybe not $300 oil, but mines in the Strait of Hormuz in 1988. Uh, there was a U.S. frigate hit a mine, and then the United States threw a fit. And we sank half of the Iranian Navy in about four hours. True story. Look it up. It was called Operation Praying Mantis. It was the United States' proportional response. Check out a channel called The Fat Electrician. Did a hilarious video about that, by the way. Um, we are two moves away from that right now. And, you know, if you're playing chess, you got to look several moves ahead. It's not that hard to see where this one is going. So that's why I'm sticking with the Red Sea story. Uh, it's an important one. And, uh, well, thank you very much, Steve Canyon. Appreciate the super chat, sir. The kind words, the support of the channel. And I hope things get better in the Red Sea. Again, this doesn't help anybody, all this nonsense that's going on over there. And thank you very much to Mr. Alex Lieberman, who is sending uh, my Mr. Cool Man there in the shades. It's a super sticker. For whatever reason, the super stickers don't come up in StreamYard. I don't know why. They should, but they don't. But thank you, Alex. I appreciate the super chat. The support of the channel, sir, very much. And, guys, I want to say thank you very much for having your coffee with the Melonheads this morning. Hope you guys have an awesome Thursday. Thank you very much for all the super chats. Thanks again to my Patreon supporters for everything you guys do for the channel. Links down below to all that good stuff. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Love you guys. Until next time, live small and dream big.